think uh, more so than any other uh, building type out there, a super tall tower really needs the perfect marriage of a fantastic architect and a fantastic engineer. Um, one really can't work without the other on this. So when we were setting up the competition in the first place, um, who was going to be the key engineering consultants was as important as who was going to be the architect. When I first met uh, Adrian Smith, we went for lunch in a little bistro in Br Brooklyn and we looked back at the Manhattan skyline and we looked at all those incredible tall towers and started to get inspired about how we can do this ourselves. As, a, as an architect, uh, personally, I always found that any project I ever did, I had my very best ideas almost on the first five minutes or the first minute of a project. And then I would spend the next month or two coming up with the three options, as every client seems to ask. Give me three options. I don't want to like the first one. I asked Adrian about how should we structure this competition? Do we go ask five firms, spend three months, short list, another three months, grind down, take a year to get to the final winning scheme? And I think we both agreed, forget about all that. You're going to have the best idea in the first two weeks. SOM has got the uh, ability to pull this building off no matter what we design. So let's just keep it short, fast. And so we did. And I'm looking at the image behind me here today. Even though it was much shorter at only 550 meters when we did the competition, enough to beat the world record but not shatter it the way we're going today. Uh, but the vision has been maintained since that competition onward. Our chairman, our board of directors loved the image that he came up with and that's what we've really stuck with ever since. So now I welcome to the stage Adrian Smith, current design partner with Adrian Smith plus Gord Gill. And then during his time at SOM he was the design partner for the Burst Bud. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, uh, Mohammed, for that wonderfully inspirational speech. Uh, it's not often when you have a client who is uh, both inspiring and intelligent about what he's, uh, what he's trying to achieve in his uh, personal career and uh, what he's trying to achieve for his uh, business and what he's trying to achieve for this country. And um, Mohammed is uh, such a person as that. He's uh, an unbelievable individual and it's uh, a great pleasure to have worked with him. Um, to start out, I want to just uh, correct one thing that Mark said. Uh, he said that we presented something at 5.50 uh, in the competition. I have a little secret to tell. It's probably the first time I've ever told anybody this, but uh, the rendering that we showed was more around 700 meters, and uh, uh, that uh, that's one of the reasons why it had such a nice elegant aspect ratio. He probably didn't realize that until later, but uh, then it took me, after we won the competition, he kept saying, no, make it 550, make it 550. That's the world's tallest building. That's all we need. And I said, Mark, I can't get it to look like <laughs> the competition scheme if it's 550. So we spent the next six months trying to get it uh, proportionally correct. So. Um, Anyway, so you want to build the tallest building. <laughs> uh, this slide fits in at the end of the show uh, in a kind of interesting way that you'll see. In terms of what we drew upon, what I drew upon to, um, to create this image or to uh, design this building, there were a number of influences. And um, I show this, this, uh, this piece, this is Mies van der Rohe's uh, Friedrichstrasse competition in 1922. Uh, not because it was a direct influence, but it was a very indirect influence. The uh, plan on this, I hope you can see us, uh, the plan on this was a central core with three wings and um, it was a residential building, um, and it uh, later inspired um, this building, which was Lake Point Towers by George Shipwright and Heinrich in the late 60s. Uh, this is uh, a building in Chicago that most of you are aware of and know of, um, and it has this similar uh, footprint with the central core where the elevators are going through the center three corridors that go out towards the legs 
and units around the legs, and it turns out to be an ideal floor plate for most residential typologies because you can get the maximum amount of exterior wall for the correct lease spans that you need for your interior space. And um, the angles of the legs are such that you're not really looking into your neighbor's apartment. And um, this particular scheme was a gross simplification of uh, Mises' project. And when I started to do a project in uh, Seoul, Korea for Samsung, uh, I looked at both of those precedents and uh, designed a 92-story building along with Bill Baker. Uh, and this was later revised down to a 73-story building, but I think it's probably still Seoul's tallest building. Uh, this was a residential building and had a similar footprint, although we articulated the facades, and in this particular building, half of the facades are double wall, primarily because they have enclosed balconies. And uh, on this particular scheme, we started to stretch the structure out into the three legs to make it more efficient and more stable. This building was a composite structure where the concrete core um, was um, put up and then steel framing came in afterwards um, because the market in Korea didn't really trust an all concrete structure. Um, this also had exterior uh, windows and uh, air conditioning systems that were actually using exterior air directly into the unit. So what is Dubai like? What are the influences uh, in the Middle East that we should be taking into consideration at the same time that we're looking at uh, building typologies and how to evolve the building typologies into a world's tallest building? Um, there were a number of factors. One is the influence of Dubai, uh, which is basically next to or in the desert and it's also on the water. So you have soft undulating forms that are surrounding you. There's a context of um, the earth and the water that is soft and is uh, sometimes very sensuous in the way light reflects off of the surfaces. Uh, there's also a spiraling ingredient to the Middle Eastern uh, architectural typologies, especially uh, uh, many of the um, Islamic towers where um, there's a spiraling uh, aspect to its, to its form. So we took that into account. We also looked at uh, patterning and geometries, uh, the way that they start to document them, the way that everything becomes triangulated, and how uh, those documents begin to get into a three-dimensional format which becomes architecture. The way that that architecture evolves into uh, important gateways and entryway pieces and uh, the way that those pieces build upon themselves to create larger scale patterns. Um, this was part of the memory of the place um, that helped to evolve a specific language for the Burj Dubai that is carried throughout uh, all aspects of the detailing of Burj and, and is fundamental in its um, basic shaping. Uh, the calligraphy here is very beautiful and it also has uh, uh, a reinforcing quality to the um, to the desert sands and the waters, and we abstracted those and used those in certain areas uh, in the interiors to uh, begin to evoke uh, this characteristic and this this sense of of uh, Arabic uh, culture into the building. So. The competition that Mark commented about. Uh, this image at the top of the building uh, is the competition image from the plan. 
And it was this image that we saw in plan that we said, hey, this looks like a flower. Let's call this the desert flower. And so the desert flower stuck in terms of uh, a, a name for this building. And you can see the shadow on the, on the lower right-hand side there. Uh, the circulation was always around the building. And uh, in this particular um, competition entry, we had built up the base of the building where the hotel had a lot of, uh, a lot of its functions within and near and adjacent to the tower so that there was quite a large bustle piece to this. Uh, we worked on the tripartite geom geometries within the building, and we came up with this this image. And this was the uh, so-called 550 image, which was actually more like 700 by the time you get to the tower. Uh, at this time, this was a seven-tier, a a 12-tier building. Uh, you can see the base of the building has um, three smaller wings to it that house the public functions of the hotel. And then the tower rised with three wings that stepped in a spiraling pattern. Although it's kind of hard to, to see the spiraling pattern from most angles because you're only seeing two of the three legs. The other leg is usually in between. Uh, so with the flower idea, we began to uh, solidify that as a, as a notion. And then we started, we won the project, and we started in earnest to uh, develop the exterior of the building and develop the interior of the building. Uh, and we, the, the, the elevation on the left is the elevation of their competition entry. Uh, the other two elevations here are both 12-tier buildings, uh, looking at how, how to begin to articulate this mass more and try to make it read still more slender and get more program into it. And uh, this process lasted for a period of months while we were searching for, um, for, ch searching for the right proportional relationships between uh, the base in the middle of this building and the top. And he's, these are three more. One, the one on the right was one that we tried to see if we could mitigate some of the vortex shedding at the top of the building. It turned out that didn't work. Um, and then the one on the left is one that we had kept for some time. That, um, and that was uh, when we started to do the construction documents of this building. Uh, by the time we got to this, there were 24 tiers in the building. Then we started in earnest to study the top because I felt the top still wasn't right. Um, and we did a whole series of, of uh, extruded and uh, telescoping tops that kept the language of the appealing away of the, of the mass at the top of the building so that it could reach even higher. Uh, this was not done to, to make it still the world's tallest building. It was really done for the purpose of finding the proportion that was right for this building, which we knew would be the landmark, the landmark for some time for Dubai. So we thought we had to get it right. Uh, and we finally ended up with what you see here. Uh, this one has 27 tiers. And still maintains the spiraling concept. Uh, still remains stepping back. It still has uh, one of the advantages that there are no transfers within this. They're just setbacks. So Bill is very proud of that. Uh, the base also is is on a landscape that uh, terraces down. It's a uh, hotel is on the highest zone, and then the residential entry is one level below that, and the office is one level below that. So you have spiraling down, you have spiraling up. Just a few things. Uh, the main entrance is off of uh, Burj Dubai Boulevard. And from this point, you go through a series of uh, security gates. So everything is securitized. Uh, this becomes the hotel entry, which is at an elevation of plus 16. And this is where you drop off and pick up from the hotel, and also where you go into parking for the hotel users. This entry 
entrance is the residential entrance. Uh, it's at elevation 10. And it also has its own parking entrance and egress. And at this location is where we have our office entrance. This is the office entrance that is the component that's up on the top of the tower. Uh, here we also have a six-story office building called the Office Annex. And you enter that off of the driveway to the hotel. And we have a small building here called the Spa Building, where we have swimming pools and uh, exercise facilities and things of this sort. I think that Mohammed might be rethinking this because it's kind of a valuable piece right now. And uh, I'm not sure who wants to put the spa there, from what I understand. So in terms of, uh, in terms of the vertical uh, aspect of the building, the, the tower height is still very confidential. If any of you know, please let me know. <coughs> The tower area is uh, approximately 3 million square feet in the tower and 2 million square feet in the podium. We have 3,000 cars of parking spaces uh, below the podium. And within the tower, we have 172 hotel rooms and 420, uh, 492 hotel residences. Uh, service apartments, service condos. The typical floor for those hotel residences are in this traditional y shaped plan. Uh, you can see that each of these 30 foot bays have a, have a curved surface, uh, which is sort of like a big bay window, and that peels back as the building steps back. Uh, the next section of the tower we see to the residences there are 354 uh, residences and 232 luxury residences at the time that this drawing was done. And you can see the, once you get up into the middle sections of the building, we peel back to the bays, and uh, the remaining two bays create quite a compact uh, floor plate. At the top of the building, we have, uh, at this point, we have offices, and then there are six special floors. In addition to the mechanical levels, there's at the very top of the building, we have communication floors, three of them. The observation deck is at level 124. That's the highest if you go at that time with the elevator systems available to us. I think now we can probably go up to 500 meters. This was something less. Uh, we have the residential club, uh, the office sky lobby just below that, and then the residential, residential hotel club below that. Then we have two residential sky lobbies and spas at the uh, lower two bars. Some of the special characteristics that we dealt with, uh, Bill will talk about stack effect and uh, the mitigation of that stack effect. And we worked very hard together for a long time to get the right uh, level of steps and where the steps occurred and how they were oriented on the site. Bill did at least four wind tunnel studies, maybe more, uh, during this process to, uh, to refine that. But uh, the wind issues that we looked at were more uh, how does it affect the facade and how does it affect people that are going to use the terraces on the building. And this is a general diagram of uh, wind speeds and pressures throughout the building and wind speeds and pressures on the terraces that we hope to use. Um, and we found that in some areas the wind was okay and in some areas we had some uh, particular problems. So we began to develop a strategy on each terrace so that we could mitigate the wind and still make them comfortable for use of the occupants, which is what you see here. Uh, the stack effect, uh, the stack effect here in a hot climate is the reverse of northern climates where the wind is actually the dropping down through the building, the cold climate uh, creates pressures uh, down near the base of the building and entrances and doors. But there are a number of attitudes here to um, mitigate these forces. Among them were to use revolving doors and locks and gaskets to keep a very airtight building skin, uh, to keep the mechanical systems balanced. 
uh, I've used airlocks and uh, intermediate level uh, lobbies and uh, areas of refuge to uh, keep the uh, stack effect to a minimum. And this is something that's incredibly important. A lot of people don't live by it, and when they don't live by it, um, they usually have a problem. I can tell you on Jin Mao Tower, uh, we located we, we located revolving doors throughout the building. Uh, we didn't we lost control in terms of the architecture of the interiors at the hotel. They took out a, a revolving door, so whenever you go up to the 54th floor in those sky lobbies and you step out, you just wish everything you know all the air is rushing by you because the uh, the client decided not to put the revolving door there. So uh, it's. For, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know, he'd lose his dish dash. <laughs> uh, exterior walls on the tower. Uh, this actually um, came together remarkably quickly. We presented, uh, on the uh, left-hand side of this, we presented some full-scale mock-ups. Uh, Kenny Turner and I were bringing these over, and uh, uh, I think it was a July day here. And uh, we decided to go outside so we could see these in the, uh, with natural light. And we put this five foot by five foot mock-up um, up on the patio and uh, went in and said, okay, it's ready now. We came back out and the whole thing had fallen apart because all the uh, double stick tape was so, <laughs> so elastic that it couldn't hold it uh, with the 70 degree uh, humidity and 100 and it was at least 115, 120 degrees at that time. So we laid it down and we looked at various mulling configurations with pipes and with uh, extrusions and we came up with uh, uh, this wing shape uh, mulling system. And we looked at that both in uh, a textured uh, aluminum and a polished stainless steel. And uh, Mohammed liked it. He says, let's make a mock-up. And so in two weeks time, I think it was Turner that orchestrated that, had, uh, had built this, uh, this mock-up on the site, a uh, full-scale mock-up. We'd never be able to get that done in the States that quickly. Uh, so we went out and we chose the materials we liked, and uh, that's pretty much what you see on the building now. Um, we developed uh, a slightly different articulation at the mechanical floors, and uh, these, uh, these large tubes came later as we developed uh, a need to have uh, window washing on three different levels of this tower. It turned out that if we had all our window washing coming from the top, we couldn't keep the building washed uh, throughout its cycle. Uh, we looked at canopies for the office building, and we looked at mock-ups for the base of the building. And here's another, another view of that. And um, one of the sustainable features on this building is the entrance pavilion. There are three of these. Each one of them is a double wall construction with a two meter interstitial space where air can flow in from the base and out, be out exhausted out the top, where we have um, 300 millimeter uh, sunshade devices that can operate uh, with the building management system to keep it open so that we get natural light in or shut it when, the, uh, when these uh, pavilions are being hit by the west sun. And this is a, uh, I don't know if Paul's going to cover this structurally, but it's a double cable net structure uh, the, in the entire thing. So it should be quite a, an elegant piece when it's finished. Studied canopies on it and how it sits in the, uh, in the overall composition at the base of the building. Uh, interior spaces, this was uh, the office entry. It's changed a little bit, but not much since this slide. Uh, coming up to the mezzanine where we enter the elevators, the security points at that point. Another view of that with these glass uh, ice cubes that glow as you enter, enter through them. This becomes the residential entry, the, uh, the piece that is, this is the interior of the pavilion looking at the uh, at the bridge going across uh, landscaping, the water features and artwork. 
And once you're into the inner zone of that lobby, you're in the tower itself, the forms are very fluid and dynamic. We have the spa entry, and we enter over this uh, water feature to the swimming pool. Uh, the swimming pool with uh, a water wall around the uh, spiral stair. And elegant, uh, elegant uh, shower rooms really designed by Nada, Nada Andrik. And uh, construction photographs, this is the building at about 102, 103 stories. Uh, and this is the same building <laughs> uh, a couple months later at about 140 some stories. I like this picture because it has the, uh, the image of Burj on the, uh, on the wall next to it. So it shows what it's going to look like from that view. Um, and some skin drawing, some recent photographs of the skin. The way it reflects light, looking up at the building, looking out from the building at the 103rd floor, looking out from the building at the 103rd floor with clouds, and then looking at the reflection in the water of uh, the fountain at the, uh, at the palace, palace hotel. Here it is again makes an interesting composition with the entries to the Palace Hotel. And then I love this slide. This was uh, in, in December. They had a children's art fair here, and they lined up about eight panels that were uh, 10 to 15 meters long and about two meters high. And the ch they gave the children paint and said, go to it. And they were drawing and painting all over these uh, panels. And, I came upon this one sketch, which was obviously a child's drawing of Burj Dubai with uh, King Kong on it. <laughs> and so that's why I put the first slide in. <laughs> and this is an image of uh, most of the team, not all of the team at, at SOM, but uh, it takes a village to do a tower like this. <laughs> so thank you.